It was last Sunday, July 22nd, when the Colorado community of Aurora, they gathered together to grieve the loss of their loved ones who died after a lone gunman opened fire in a local movie theater. It was with flowers, candles, tears, and prayers that the survivors gathered together with others from their community. They gathered together to share their memories. They gathered together to comfort one another in this time of grief. It's in times just like this that we ought to give pause so that we might consider the positive and the negative effects that occur whenever we find ourselves in the grip of grief. Uh, It'll help us to know that grief is that strong and sometimes overwhelming emotion that we experience whenever we discover that someone that we care about has received maybe a terminal diagnosis from their doctor. Our hearts are filled with grief. Grief is the deep, intense anguish that we feel whenever we suffer the loss of a loved one. Well, grief is a natural reaction to situations such as these. It's also important to understand the nature of the grief that we feel so that we don't end up allowing these strong emotions of grief to ruin the rest of our lives. Here in our study today, we're going to consider those natural feelings that cause our hearts and minds to be filled with grief. And as we do, we're also going to learn about the correct and even incorrect ways to grieve the loss of a loved one. And so if you're taking notes this morning, it'll help you to understand that, first of all, we're going to consider how the grip of grief can cause emotional affliction. Secondly, this morning, we'll learn that the grip of grief can cause distressful indignation. Thirdly, this morning, we'll see how the grip of grief can cause sorrowful depression And finally, today, we'll see that the grip of grief can cause respectful reflection. With this as our outline, let's open our Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 1, because there we find David struggling with the feelings of grief after hearing about the death of Saul and his son, Jonathan. As you're opening your Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 1, I want to set the stage for our study today by first reminding you about the war between the Philistines and the Israelites that occurred towards the end of 1 Samuel. It'll help you to remember that the book of 1 Samuel ends with the Philistines invading the land of Israel. And there on Mount Gilboa, the Philistines overtook the camp of the Israelites and they slaughtered the armies of Saul. Then as the battle ended, it was discovered that Saul and his sons were dead. And as a result, the children of Israel fled as the Lord gave the land of Israel into the hand of the Philistines. Then in the opening verses of 2 Samuel chapter 1, we're introduced to an Amalekite man. He arrives in Ziklag with the crown of King Saul in his hand. And with the crown in his hand, he tells David a story about the way in which he found King Saul close to death. And not only that, but this Amalekite man also told David that Saul was begging him to end his life. As the story goes, the foreigner obliged and ended Saul's life. And it's with this background in mind that I want to continue our study of 2 Samuel chapter 1. Let's begin reading there at verse 11, because there we learn that David took hold of his own clothes and tore them, and so did all the men who were with him. And they mourned and wept and fasted until evening for Saul and for Jonathan his son, for the people of the Lord and for the house of Israel, because they had fallen by the sword. Then David said to the young man who told him, Where are you from? And he answered, I am the son of an alien, an Amalekite. So David said to him, How was it you were not afraid to put forth your hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? Then David called one of the young men and said, Go near and execute him. And he struck him so that he died. So David said to him, Your blood is on your own head, for your own mouth has testified against you, saying, I have killed the Lord's anointed. Then David lamented with this lamentation over Saul and over Jonathan his son. And he told them to teach the children of Judah the song of the bow. Indeed, it is written in the book of Jasher. The beauty of Israel is slain on your high places, how the mighty have fallen. 
Tell it not in Gath. Proclaim it not in the streets of Ashkelon. Lest the daughters of the Philistines rejoice. Lest the daughters of the uncircumcised triumph. O mountains of Gilboa, let there be no dew nor rain upon you, nor fields of offerings. For the shield of the mighty is cast away there, the shield of Saul, not anointed with oil. From the blood of the slain, from the fat of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan did not turn back, and the sword of Saul did not return empty. Saul and Jonathan were beloved and pleasant in their, uh, in their lives, and in their death they were not divided. They were swifter than eagles. They were stronger than lions. O daughters of Israel, weep over Saul, who clothed you in scarlet with luxury, who put ornaments of gold on your apparel. How the mighty have fallen in the midst of the battle. Jonathan was slain in your high places. I am distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. You have been very pleasant to me. Your love to me was wonderful, surpassing the love of women. How the mighty have fallen and the weapons of war perished. Here in our text today, we find David and his men grieving over the death of Saul and his son Jonathan. And as we consider the response of these men, we must take a moment to remember that Saul was the one who actually had robbed David of his first wife. Saul was the one who had robbed David of his first home there in Israel. It was Saul who robbed David of his first job as the captain of the Lord's army. Not only that, but Saul was also the one who caused David to spend the best years of his life running from place to place, hiding in caves and in forests and even in pagan countries just to escape the unrighteous rage of a jealous king. And now that Saul was dead, you might think that David would have a little party. You might think that he would invite all of his friends out and kill the fatted calf and have a nice big meal. It's party time. Saul is dead. You might think that he would, but he didn't. Instead, he grieved for Saul as if Saul was his own father. And as we consider the grief of David here, as we consider the grief of his men, we should first notice that the news of Saul's death caused great emotional affliction. We should notice that this emotional affliction was demonstrated in four distinct ways. Notice with me again there at verse 11. There we learn that David took hold of his own clothes and tore them. And so did all the men who were with him. And they mourned and wept and fasted until evening for Saul and for Jonathan his son and the people of the Lord and for the house of Israel because they had fallen by the sword. Now here in these verses, we find David and all of his men there tearing their clothes after hearing about the death of Saul and Jonathan. It'll help us to know that this demonstration was just their way of saying, I'm all torn up inside. This is how I feel on the inside as they tear their clothes. And listen, they couldn't just run down to Ross Dress for Less to go buy some new outfits. They tore their clothes. to demonstrate how torn up they were inside. And not only that, but there in verse 12, we see the second demonstration of their emotional affliction. It's described as mourning. They mourned. And listen, we're not talking about uh, sadness that leads to a bit of sorrow. It's not like, oh, this is a bummer. No, instead this mourning would would be better described as the prolonged shout of pain, which we would call in this day and age, wailing. They were wailing. So these guys expressed their emotional affliction by tearing their clothes and by crying out with wailing. The third demonstration of emotional affliction is found there in verse 4. It's described as weeping. And we should understand that this doesn't refer refer to like a single tear, you know, or just kind of like a welling up in the eyes that never really results in in tears. No, this, this idea of weeping These guys were expressing their grief with tears and tears that flowed like rain. So we see that these guys were expressing their grief by tearing their clothes, by wailing out loud with a shout, and by weeping with many tears. And finally, the fourth demonstration of emotional affliction is found there in verse 4. It's described as fasting. This word fast literally means to shut the mouth. Next time someone's talking too much, you just 
might suggest that they fast for a little while. But this idea of shutting the mouth means, hey, I'm abstaining from food. Can't even eat. Now, here in our day and age, awake would include lots of finger foods. So it's an idea of coming together and eating together and whatnot, but not these guys, no. They're saying, we're not eating. We're going to close our mouth, and we're not going to eat a, a bite. As we consider the way that David and his men demonstrated their grief by tearing their clothes, by mourning, by weeping, and by fasting, there really should be no doubt in our minds that the death of Saul and his son Jonathan had afflicted their hearts and minds. And it's from their example that it's important for us to understand that it is natural for grief to cause this sort of emotional affliction. It's natural. And in order to prove my point, if you would, hold your place here in 2 Samuel and turn with me to John chapter 11. You see, it's in John chapter 11 that we find another story about death. It's the story of Lazarus' death. And I should remind you that before Lazarus died, his sisters, Mary and Martha, they sent for Jesus. They knew that Jesus was the great healer. And they wanted Jesus to come to the aid of their brother. And they asked him to come and heal their brother. But rather than rushing back to Bethany where Lazarus was laying on his sickbed, Jesus stayed two more days just beyond the Jordan River before returning home to his three friends. He decided to stay two more days rather than coming to the aid of Lazarus. And by the time he arrived in Bethany, Lazarus, well, he had already died. Now with this background in mind, let's consider the emotional affliction that Mary was experiencing as she mourned the loss of her brother. Look with me there at John chapter 11. I want to begin reading at verse 31 because there we learn that the Jews who were with her in the house and comforting her when they saw that Mary rose up quickly and went out, followed her saying, she is going to the tomb to weep there. Then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. Now, here in these verses, we find Mary weeping over the loss of her brother Lazarus. And from this we see that Mary was suffering the emotional affliction that occurs whenever the people that we love pass from this plane of existence. And listen, when Jesus saw Mary weeping, he knew. He knew. He was about to raise him from the grave. Jesus wasn't confused about what he was about to do. As a matter of fact, we know from the text that Jesus had waited those two days to allow Lazarus to die so that he could show his power in raising Lazarus from the grave. And so Jesus knew that Lazarus was going to live again. And yet before he brought Lazarus back from the dead, he took a moment to commiserate with Mary by weeping with her. He mourned with her. as she mourned the death of her brother. Notice again there in verse 35. There John tells us that Jesus wept. Now as we read this verse, it would be easy to conclude that he was weeping because Lazarus had died, but we must remember he knew he was about to raise Lazarus from the grave, and with that being the case, and it's my strong opinion that Jesus wasn't weeping over the death of Lazarus, but instead he was weeping because he saw the emotional affliction that Mary was experiencing. He was weeping because he saw the pain that Mary was in. And listen, Jesus didn't tell her to stop weeping. Jesus didn't say, now Mary, we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, and blah, blah, blah. He didn't do that. That's true. 
God does work in all things for the good of those who love him, but he's not giving her this spiritual platitude, but just weeping with her, commiserating with her, experiencing the emotional affliction with her. And from his example, we see that those who want to be like Christ ought to learn how to mourn with those who mourn. With this in mind, I should remind you of Paul's encouragement, which is found in Romans chapter 12. He encouraged the Christians in Rome to weep with those who weep. In other words, whenever you meet someone who is suffering the emotional affliction of grief, it's not your job to try to cheer them up. But rather, just just weep with them. To be a shoulder to cry on. We would do better rather than trying to cheer them up to just weep with them as they mourn the loss of their loved one. Not only have we been called to weep with those who weep, but I also want to bring this to a personal point of application because what this also means is that it's okay to experience emotional affliction. It's okay to grieve. And I say this because I've met people who attempt to spiritualize their emotions by suppressing any feelings of grief because that would be a demonstration of a lack of faith in God. If I grieve, then I'm disagreeing with God that this is his perfect will and be careful. I don't think that it's wrong to grieve. I don't think that it's wrong to experience emotional affliction. Jesus didn't correct Mary, but rather he wept with her. And so don't feel bad if you're grieving. Don't feel like you're sinning or that you don't have faith if you're grieving. It's natural to grieve the loss of a loved one. Whenever we suffer the loss of a loved one, it's okay to feel the pain of emotional affliction Because death is the result of sin, and therefore it's contrary to God's original design. And so it ought to bring us to a point of grief. We ought to grieve over death. From this we see it's only natural for grief to cause emotional affliction in the hearts of those who have lost a loved one. But not only that, I want to also consider how the grip of grief can also cause distressful indignation now with this in mind let's turn back to second samuel chapter one because there we find david filled with this distressful indignation if you would look with me there at verse 13 because there we learn that david said to the young man who told him where are you from and he answered i am the son of an alien and a malachite so david said to him how was it that you were not afraid to put forth your hand to destroy the lord's anointed and david called one of the young men and said go near and execute him he struck him so that he died So David said to him, your blood is on your own head, for your own mouth has testified against you, saying, I have killed the Lord's anointed. Here in these verses we find David discovering that the young man who claimed to have ended Saul's life was an Amalekite man. And in light of this information, I should remind you that, that David and his men, they had just returned from a rescue mission. As a matter of fact, in 1 Samuel chapter 30, we learn that the Amalekites had invaded the homes of David and his men there in Ziklag, and they kidnapped their wives, they kidnapped their children, and carried them away as slaves. When they found out, David and his men, they chased these Amalekites down and rescued their families after killing their captors. But now here it is, just three days later, three days after that battle, and David finds himself face to face with another Amalekite. Can you say, wrong time, wrong place, for this guy at least. I can't help but to imagine the anger that filled David's heart as he learned that an Amalekite man was responsible for King Saul's death. Now, we know based on the true story of how King Saul died that this Amalekite man wasn't actually responsible for it. This guy was just telling a lie, trying to get you know, some reward money from King David. He thought King David would be all rejoicing and happy and he would be rewarded and showered with treasure. It didn't really work out that way for him. Now, as David heard about the death of King Saul, his heart filled with grief. 
began to experience emotional affliction as he tore his clothes and mourned and wept and fasted. And yet this emotional affliction continued to to grow in his heart until it became distressful indignation as he began to consider the role that this Amalekite man allegedly played in the death of the Lord's anointed. And though Saul was already dying because the wounds had been caused by the archers of the Philistines, and chances are when this Amalekite man found Saul, he was already dead. But David's grief over Saul's death led him to act out upon his feelings, and and all of a sudden, this guy's life was in danger. Notice again there at verse 14. We find David there asking the Amalekite man, how was it you were not afraid to put forth your hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? Now, it seems like David's asking this guy the question after he's already dead. But he's still asking this question. Who are you to execute the Lord's anointed? And there in verse 15 we learn, David called to one of the young men and said, go near and execute him. So he struck him and he was dead. Now as the man was dying, David David said, your blood is on your own hand, for your own mouth has testified against you, saying I've killed the Lord's anointed. And from this, we see that David's grief quickly went from emotional affliction to distressful indignation. And his grief turned into this distressful indignation. Well, David found it really easy to lay the blame on the Shoulders of this Amalekite man. David once wanted someone to blame. David wanted someone to pay. He was angry. And he wanted revenge. And so he laid the blame at the feet of the one who took the blame for himself. And with with this distressful indignation, with this heart filled with rage and anger. David claimed the life of this man. Now from this example, I want to take some time to consider how we too can allow our grief to become distressful indignation. If you would, hold your place here in 2 Samuel. Let's turn back to John chapter 11. You see, it's in John chapter 11 again that we find the death of Lazarus. And there in this chapter, we not only find Mary reacting to the death of her brother, Lazarus, with emotional affliction. She was weeping and mourning. But Martha, her sister, was a little different. We don't really find Martha necessarily weeping and mourning, but rather reacting with a level of indignation towards the Lord. If you would look with me there at John chapter 11, I want to begin there at verse 19 because there John tells us that many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, but Mary was sitting in the house. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Can you hear the indignation and the accusation? Here in these verses, we find Martha's reaction to her brother Lazarus' death. And while her sister Mary was there weeping, Martha was filled with indignation. As a result, she began to lay the blame at the feet of Jesus. If you'd have been there, if you'd have been here on time, my brother would not have died. In other words, Martha seemed to be suggesting that Lazarus' death was Jesus' fault. Now, I believe that Martha probably knew that her feelings of indignation towards Jesus were wrong. I, I do think that she had some sense about her to know that Lazarus' death was not really Jesus' fault, but still the indignation is wanting her to bring blame somewhere. She knew it was wrong. Look with me there at verse 22. Martha declares, but even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. So there's some hope there, but but she's still saying, had you been here though, he wouldn't have died. So while Martha probably knew that Lazarus' death wasn't Jesus' fault, she she was allowing her grief to cause distressful indignation, laying the blame at the feet of Jesus. She really kind of felt deep in her heart that Jesus was responsible for the death of her brother because he wasn't there. 
she knew how long it took to get from beyond the Jordan to Bethany. She knew Jesus could have made it on time. And so in her heart, Jesus was to blame. Listen, if we're brutally honest with ourselves, then we should admit this morning that it's easy for us to allow our grief to become distressful indignation, which then is directed towards whoever we can blame. Like David, maybe we'll blame the first person who comes along and tells us the story. Here's what happens. Oh, it's your fault. And we lay the blame at the feet of the person who tells us the bad news. Many other times, we allow that blame to end up at God's doorstep. Because ultimately, he's in control, right? And so isn't this God's fault? Many would ask, why would God allow someone to come into a movie theater and shoot people? Why would God allow that school bus full of children to crash and allow kids to die? Why would God allow? It's easy for us to allow our grief to become distressful indignation as we begin to get angry with God for allowing these things to happen. I know that's what I did back in 1981 when my mom died of cancer. I was 12 years old, going on 13. Didn't really even know that she was that sick. But all I know is that she was rushed to the hospital one day and we went home without my mom. Now she was the most committed Christian that I knew up until that point in my life. She read her Bible every day. She constantly prayed. And when she got sick, pastor and deacons and elders would gather around and they'd claim healing over her life and they would speak it in the name of Jesus and they did all of those things and so I just thought, well, they say that if you name it and claim it then you can get it and grab it and she'll be fine. But she wasn't fine. At the age of 33, my mom died of cancer. And I was grieving for a moment, but that grief quickly turned into distressful indignation as I shook my fist at God and said, how could you allow this to happen? I blamed God for the death of my mother. Maybe you can relate. It's possible that you're here this morning and you've lost a loved one, and your grief has caused your heart to be filled with the resentment of distressful indignation, and maybe you're a, you're a parent who has lost a child. Maybe you're a child who has lost a parent. Maybe you're a spouse who has lost a husband or a wife. It's possible that you've even lost your best friend or, or maybe a beloved pet. And ever since then, you've been angry with God. You shook your fist at God and said, how could you allow this to happen? Why didn't you spare the life of my loved one? If you had been here, Jesus, then my loved one wouldn't be dead. Now, if this describes you, then it's important to remember a few things. First of all, we must remember that God didn't bring sin into the world. Man did. Man brought sin into the world, and sin brought death. Therefore, death isn't God's fault. But rather, it's the result of sin. It's the result of rebellion. And not only that, but listen, we must also remember that God sent his only begotten son to die for us. Jesus came and died for us so that those who believe in him, though they're going to die, they're going to live again as well because Jesus is going to raise them up and give them everlasting life. And so while man decided to bring sin into the world and death by sin, God already had a plan to solve the problem by sending his only begotten son to die for us so that we could live again. That being the case, if grief has filled your heart with distressful indignation, then I want to encourage you, place your faith in God. Place your faith in God because he has a solution for the problem of death. 
And while that might not remove every ounce of grief in your heart, I hope that it will at least remove the distressful indignation that we feel as we begin to blame God. It's not God's fault. And you can say, yeah, but God could have stopped it. It's true. He could have. But then we have to wonder, well, would God be a loving God if he stopped every single bad thing from happening? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. God knows the beginning from the end. He knows what's right. And so we must trust him and believe that what he allows, he allows for our good. And so let's not be mad at God. But let's just grieve with the, with the knowledge and the understanding that God has allowed this to happen because he does have a perfect plan. So we see then that the grip of grief can cause emotional affliction as we mourn the loss of a loved one. And not only that, but the grip of grief can also cause distressful indignation as we seek to lay blame somewhere and sometimes even blame God. But furthermore, we should take some time to consider how the grip of grief can also cause sorrowful depression. And with this in mind, let's turn back to 2 Samuel chapter 1 because there we find David filled with distressful indignation. If you would look with me there at verse 17. There we learn that David lamented with this lamentation over Saul and over Jonathan, his son. Now here in this verse, we find David lamenting over the loss of Saul and his best friend, Jonathan. And it'll help us to know that the word lamentation there, it means to feel or express mourning or regret. And it also speaks of the sorrowful depression that occurs in the soul of the person who is mourning the loss of a loved one. So we see then that David was depressed with great sorrow as the news of Saul and Jonathan began to sink in. The shock was beginning to wear off. The depression was beginning to sink in. And it's from this example that we should take a moment to consider how grief can cause sorrowful depression in the lives of those who suffer the loss of a loved one. And so if you would hold your place here in 2 Samuel, turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And as you turn to 1 Thessalonians 4, I want to point out that grief will oftentimes turn into depression. The reason why is found in the fact that the person who is filled with grief after losing a loved one will attempt to imagine their life without the person who has passed away. And that's tough. It's a hard thing to begin to consider what my life will be like without this person. And as we begin to try to imagine what it's going to be like to continue to live without that loved one in our life, our hearts begin to become overwhelmed with that sense of hopelessness as we realize that there's nothing that we can do to bring that person back. Many problems don't cause depression because there's a solution. I just have to get past this month, or I just have to get past this year, or I just have to get past this problem. I just have to wait for this medicine to kick in. There's a solution. And so there's a little grief, but it goes away. It doesn't turn into depression because there's a solution. But so many times we experience the loss of a loved one and we know that there's no real solution for it. They're not coming back. I even think about my own mom and the times that I would just think, okay, she's gone away. She's coming back. She's just on a trip. No. No. Not going to happen. And that grief can become depression as we try to imagine our lives without them. Now, if you've ever allowed your grief to turn into this sort of sorrowful depression, then please consider the encouragement of Paul found here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Look with me beginning there at verse 13 because there Paul declares, I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. This is Paul's way of saying that they've died. I don't want you to be ignorant of those who have died, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another 
with these words. Here in these verses, Paul was helping us to remember that those who trust in Jesus, they're going to get to spend eternity with one another. And so while the death of my mother and even the more recent death of my grandmother still fills my heart with grief to think about, I'm not depressed. There's grief, but there's no depression. They were both believers. And I know that I'm going to see them again. I get to spend all eternity with my mom and my grandma. Christian, listen, we can take great comfort in knowing that those who trust in the Lord will, will live forever in the presence of the Lord. And while this doesn't help us to cope with the death of those who, who, who are rejecting the grace of God, it does give us great comfort in knowing that we will be joined together again with those who love the Lord. You see, listen, our, our God is not the God of the dead, but he's, got, he's the God of the living He's the God of the living. Therefore, those who place their trust in Jesus Christ will be raised up from the grave. And what this means is that while we might mourn the loss of our friend today, others are rejoicing to meet them beyond the veil. When my mom died and I mourned her loss, there was a heavenly host rejoicing her arrival in her real home. And I take great comfort in that. But what this also means is that the death of my mother, it's only separated me from my mom for a time and a season. And that time and season will be over before I know it. Death can only separate believers for a short amount of time because Jesus has overcome death and he's overcome the grave. And so I miss her today with hope. I grieve today with hope in knowing that I will be with her again one day. The same thing is true for you. If you've lost a loved one who's trusted in Christ, then you should grieve not with sorrowful depression, but with hope, knowing that they're waiting for you just beyond the veil of this world. Now, it's possible that you're grieving the loss of a loved one and you don't know if they went to heaven or not. You don't know. There's a question mark about whether they truly trusted in Christ or not, and you, and you struggle with that. And, and, and you ask the question constantly, are they going to be in heaven? If this sounds like you, then please take comfort in knowing that God is going to do what is right. In every situation, when we get to heaven and we see what God decided, no one's going to say, oh man, what's he thinking? It's not going to happen. He is going to do what is right. And he's going to do what is righteous. And so I realize that doesn't fully comfort those who have a question mark about whether they trusted in Christ or not, or whether they're going to be in heaven or not. But all I can tell you is this, that you can take great comfort today in knowing that when we get to heaven, we're going to say, yep, he did what was right. He made the right decision on that. And so we can take comfort in knowing that God will always make the right decision. With all this in mind, I want to remind you that it's good to grieve the loss of a loved one. It is not wrong. We should grieve. But don't let your grief turn into sorrowful depression, but instead take comfort in knowing that God is going to make perfect decisions regarding those who have died before us. He always will. And so we see then that the grip of grief will cause emotional affliction in the hearts of those who have lost a loved one, and that's okay. Not only that, but the grip of grief can also cause distressful indignation in the minds who are seeking to lay blame at the feet of somewhere. So, and if that's describing you, then don't lay blame. Furthermore, we see that the grip of grief can cause sorrowful depression when we fail to remember that death is just a doorway. Don't think about all the birthdays or Christmases that you're going to miss, but think about that day that you're going to see them again in heaven. But finally, we should consider how the grip of grief should bring to our minds a respectful re reflection of, of those that we've lost. Now, with this in mind, let's turn back to 2 Samuel chapter 1, 
because there we find David reflecting respectfully about the life of Saul and Jonathan. If you would look with me there at verse 17. There we read that David lamented with this lamentation over Saul and over Jonathan, his son, and he told them to teach the children of Judah the song of the bow. Indeed, it is written in the book of Jasher. The beauty of Israel is slain on your high places. How the mighty have fallen. Tell it not in Gath. Proclaim it not in the streets of Ashkelon. Lest the daughters of the Philistines rejoice. Lest the daughters of the uncircumcised triumph. O mountains of Gilboa, let there be no dew nor rain upon you, nor fields of offerings. For the shield of the mighty is cast away there. The shield of Saul, not anointed with oil. From the blood of the slain, from the fat of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan did not turn back, and the sword of Saul did not return empty. Saul and Jonathan were beloved and pleasant in in their lives, and in their death they were not divided. They were swifter than eagles, they were stronger than lions. O daughters of Israel, weep over Saul, who clothed you in scarlet with luxury, who put ornaments of gold on your apparel. How the mighty have fallen in the midst of the battle. Jonathan was slain in your high places. I am distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. You have been very pleasant to me. Your love to me was wonderful, surpassing the love of women. How the mighty have fallen, and the weapons of war perish. Now, here in the final verses of this chapter, we find David, he's writing a song and singing this song about Saul and Jonathan. And it's with this song that David was respectfully reflecting on the best qualities of these two men. He was writing this song and, and presenting the best qualities of these two men so that those who were grieving the death of John and Jonathan and Saul, that they, they might remember them in the very best way possible. And in this song, David referred to David and Jonathan, or he, he referred to, to Saul and Jonathan as mighty and brave. He, he wrote this, this best-selling single, at the time at least, about the braveness and the might of these two warriors. And David reminds us that they were beloved and pleasant in their lives, and, and in their death they were swift and strong. And while David was respectfully reflecting on the best qualities of both these men, he focused one verse of this song on the friendship that he had with Jonathan. Notice again there in verse 26. David declares, I am distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. You have been very pleasant to me. Your love to me was wonderful, surpassing the love of women. From this, we see that David and Jonathan were the very best of friends. They were closer than brothers. I'm guessing that his wives weren't too thrilled about this love between David and Jonathan. Sounds like David may have loved Jonathan more than his wife, you know. But there's a friendship that can happen when two guys bond together, when two guys hang out. I think about the time that I spent with my good buddy Steve Westfall, who pastors the church there at Calvary Chapel of Midland. He was at youth camp this past week, and every morning we would sneak away and go to Starbucks and study together him preparing for his message, me preparing for mine, and the conversations that we got in. And a couple of mornings, his wife went with us. It was sad for her to be a third wheel, you know, in, <laughs> in the trips, but uh, she coped. But that love between two guys, that friendship that two guys can experience, it's an incredible love. And so David is, is reflecting on this relationship that he had with Jonathan especially. He wrote this song so that every person would respectfully remember these mighty men of God. And in similar fashion, our grief should lead us to respectfully remember those who have passed away. Now with this in mind, I would encourage every person here this morning who is struggling with grief, spend some time reflecting. And I would encourage you to spend more time reflecting than projecting. What do I mean by that? Well, rather than trying to imagine what your next Christmas is going to be like without that person, just spend some time thinking about what Christmas was like with them. And then respectfully reflect on that good memory. And hold it in your heart. Rather than thinking about all the birthday celebrations that you're going to miss because they're gone. Don't do that. Don't project into the future and and miss them before the day. But just think about the birthdays that you did spend together so that you can respectfully reflect on the time that you had with them. It's a much more healthy way to grieve. At At the same time, we should take a moment to consider this idea of respectful reflection in light of our own epitaph, because the fact of the matter is we're all gonna die one day. 
unless the Lord raptures us away right now. No. One can hope. But as we consider the idea of respectful reflection in light of our own epitaph, the question that we must ask ourselves is this, how difficult will I make it for those who bury me to respectfully reflect on my life? Think about it. Jonathan, he made it easy for David to write a song of remembrance about him. Saul, not so easy. I'm guessing that David maybe had a little bit of a difficult time writing some awesome things about Saul. Saul was kind of a jerk. And so how difficult are we going to make it on those who write our epitaph? Some examples of this can be seen in the awkward tombstones that are found all throughout the world. For example, there's a tombstone in Nova Scotia that reads, Here lies Ezekiel Akel, age 102. The good die young. What about the tombstone in a Uniontown, Pennsylvania cemetery, which reads, here lies the body of Jonathan Blake, stepped on the gas instead of the brake. There's the tombstone of a lawyer in England for a man named Sir John Strange. Now, Sir John Strange was a lawyer, and his tombstone reads this, here lies an honest lawyer, and that is Strange. Now, as we consider these humorous epitaphs, we might do well to take a minute just to ask ourselves, am I living in such a way that people can respectfully remember the life that I lived on the day when they grieve for me? Is the preacher going to have to lie? Or can he speak the truth in love? Listen, if you're not living in such a way that people can respectfully reflect on your life, then why not change that today? I want to encourage each person here to live your life for the Lord. With reckless abandon, live your life for the Lord. Because this is a lifestyle that is worthy of respectful reflection. There's no doubt in my mind that we've all experienced grief on some level. And while grief is a natural response to the loss of a loved one, the question that we might consider in closing is this, is my grief bringing me closer to the Lord? Or am I allowing my grief to turn into anger and bitterness and depression? If you're allowing your grief to turn into anger and bitterness, and depression, then I would encourage you to seek help this week by calling the church and asking for biblical counsel. Don't continue to be angry with God. Don't continue to allow your heart to be filled with bitterness. Don't continue to struggle with depression because of grief. But sit down and let's consider the word of God together so that we can examine the feelings in light of the scriptures. And then let's commit ourselves to aligning our grief to a Christian biblical worldview. I know that we're all going to experience grief in our lifetime. And with that being the case, then I want to encourage you to remember, number one, that the grip of grief is going to cause emotional affliction in the hearts of those who have lost a loved one. And that's okay. It's okay to mourn and weep for those that we dearly miss. And as Christians, we should mourn with those who mourn. We should weep with those who weep. And yet at the same time, we must also realize that the grip of grief can cause distressful indignation in our hearts, and our hearts can be filled with anger as we begin to try to lay blame at someone's feet. Ultimately, we start blaming God. And if you're feeling angry because God allowed someone to die, then I would remind you right now, God does work all things together for the good of those who love him. So don't be angry with God, but trust that he has a perfect plan. 
And if we see that the grip of grief is causing our hearts to fill with sorrowful depression, then let's remember that death is just a doorway to the great beyond. And those who die, trusting in Jesus Christ, will experience inexpressible joy forevermore. And so rather than spending the rest of our life grieving, let's make sure that we're leading the people around us to Jesus Christ so that they can experience the same joy that we're going to experience in heaven. Finally, we should consider how the grip of grief will begin to be released. And we will be released from the grip of grief the more we spend time respectfully reflecting on the lives of those that we love. Rather than projecting our pain into the future, let's reflect on the joy of the past as we embrace the memories of those who have passed before us. And as we feel the grip of grief, as we feel that pain, we must always remember that while death leaves a heartache, which is very hard to heal, love leaves a memory that nobody can steal.